Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts, Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. What I have to say may sound a little unusual. Oh, it's all we get day in, day out around this place. Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Brian Auten, and I'm joined as always by Chad Gross. I'm doing well. How about you? Rock and roll. And I'll tell you, the, the weather here in, in the Shire has been like uh, roasting very oh. hot. Oh, Sauron is coming, you think? <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's like Dune. Have you seen the trailer for the new Dune movie coming out? I, ha- I have. I have. Um, are, you a, look- are you a Dune fan at all? I am not. I am not. Sad, very sad, but uh, I know. But, uh, I know. Yeah, this this is a, uh, excites me. We I grew up watching Dune and um, saw the most recent trailer, and um, I'm looking forward to it. Looks really interesting. Hopefully, they do it right. Are you, are you troubled by the fact that there are so many like Marvel and DC comic actors in it? Or you don't really watch those movies, though, right? I, I'm I'm kind of troubled. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't. I avoid those. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm troubled by how like. American accenty. Most of the actors are sounding like the. Uh, there's that dude in it from uh, like uh, underwater dude. What's <laughs> underwater dude? Aquaman. Aquaman dude is. In That's it. hard and, to remember. <laughs> yeah, Aquaman dude is in it, and uh, he's just too much of like this American jock type. Uh, yeah. He just doesn't belong in the movie. But we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm open minded. I hope it lives up to expectation. Yeah, well, it'll it, at least they're coming out with something cool remade True. instead of stupid remakes. But you'll always have the Last Jedi. I mean, that's such a good oh, film. Man. <laughs> okay, we're we're really into the weeds now. So oh, anyway, know. for those who are listening, we apologize. <laughs> Another cool interview. I'm looking forward to today's interview is with Marcia Montenegro. So she's this former professional astrologer with a background of practice of over eight years, including being an active in the Metropolitan Atlanta Astrological Society, she served as a president for a year. Now, so the reason I'm kind of giving you all of her background here is so you know that, like, she's the real deal. She's not like, for example, I don't want you to get the idea that she's just this Christian who looks at uh, New Age and yoga and says, oh, that's of Satan. Go away. No, stay away. She's more like... uh like, no, she's been into the New Age, uh, the occult, Eastern beliefs and practices, inner light consciousness, Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Hindu teachings, meditation, psychic development classes. So during all this time that she was into it, she participated in past life regression, numerology, tarot cards, spirit contact, seances, astral travel, and even received a spirit guide through a guided visualization. So anyway, some people might think, well, that's just superstition. But um, I'm sure she'll have something to say about what's behind that. But she was uh, an astrologer. She was involved in all of that sort of thing. The list could go on if you want to see her detailed bio. It's over at Christian Answers for the New Age. Her ministry is Cana, C-A-N-A, Christian Answers for the New Age. Uh, ChristianAnswersfortheNewAge.org is where you'll find that. So she taught astrology for over five years. She wrote for astrological and new age publications, conducted workshops, did public speaking, weekly spot for a psychic cable TV show. But she's renounced all that to follow Jesus Christ. So uh, check out her ministry, Christian Answers for the New Age. She's also a missionary with Fellowship International Mission, an independent mission board based in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Her ministry is like an informational outreach ministry. So why are we talking to her today, Chad? Yeah. So this is really interesting that we're able to do this interview because I actually became familiar with her. She was recently uh, did a debate with uh, Pastor Todd Wilson on Justin Brierley's Unbelievable. And uh, the debate was on the Enneagram. And uh, for Christians that aren't aware what the uh, Enneagram is, uh, tune into the interview because you're going to find out. But this was especially interesting to me uh, because we I know people who actually are Christians and who claim to have benefited from the Enneagram. So that's of special interest to me to hear uh, her perspective on that. She held herself very well in the debate uh, it was the clear, you know, sometimes when you watch a debate, there's not a clear victor. Uh, I confess that in this debate, uh, she clearly knew her stuff and uh, was the more informed of the two debaters. 
And it was very helpful for me to kind of hash out how we should think about the Enneagram. I've also benefited from her work years ago when uh, The Secret came out mm-hmm. uh, by Rhonda. I think it's Brian or Bryn or something. I mean, it's yeah, something like that. It's been so long. But uh, she she wrote some uh, stuff on that that was super beneficial uh, that I was Mm -hmm. able to share with people. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And this is not an area that I myself have really dug into the new age and things like that. So it'll be it'll be great to talk to somebody who's who's lived the life and and now, of course, can look back from a Christian uh, new creation perspective. Well, yeah, I appreciate the background that she has. Uh, I'm interested in knowing you know, how she got into that and what brought her out of it and her perspective on all things new agey, you know, yeah. in the sense of you know, some Christians, I think they just, as I said, or, or as I alluded to, they may they just, they, maybe they sort of just dismiss it as, uh, well, that's just superstitious. It's harmless in the sense that there's nothing really behind it because it's not real. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I want to hear what, what she has to say about it. What, things she's encountered because if you talk to certain people who've been into new age or wicca or witchcraft and sort of things or astral projection projection there's certainly something going on there which again uh, from the skeptical aspect i'm talking about like atheist skeptics they'd say well that's just uh, that's just one more thing i don't believe in um but to my mind soon we'll be uh, also interviewing craig keener on miracles the interesting mm-hmm. thing to me is that whether you're talking about miracles today or new age or things like that, to me, naturalism is almost default false in the sense that if there's all this sort of paranormal stuff that are is a, supposedly being experienced and there's all sorts of miracles that, that are being happening in the world, all you really have to do is find one that's legit. Isn't that mm-hmm. a defeater for naturalism? And to hold yes. a naturalist position by default with knowing that there's this sort of like a background, like experiences that people have all over the world of the supernatural in one way or another, whether it's through the occult or mysticism or miracles, you know, you'd have to basically say, well, I'm I'm not going to look at all of that evidence because I'm just going to dismiss it out of hand without even hearing it. To my mind, you should say, well, <laughs> there's a lot of claims for that. So without looking at it all, I'd have to say that there's something there because, you know, let's say that 80% of it's false or whatever percent is false. There's as long as there's one claim of some sort of supernatural occurrence, whether it's a miracle or an occult thing or a Christian thing, whatever that claim, wherever that claim is coming from, to my mind, it's like, well, naturalism is not true. <laughs> you know, now mm-hmm. I'm sure um, that's not my philosophical argument. That's airtight. That's just my shoot from the hip sort of intuitive way of looking at it is like okay there's a lot of spiritual claims out there to hold naturalism a hardline naturalism when there's that that many claims you're basically saying no i know they're all false without even hearing them <laughs> you know you, you follow what i'm saying there yeah yeah and at the very least the number of those claims should at least cause you to be a bit more humble about your conclusions if i were like in the atheist crowd i would immediately bump bump over into agnosticism I would kind of maybe hold the view of, hey, like, I don't believe any of this stuff's real. I think there's a natural thing, but just keep shoveling, you know, these samples to me until I get one that's uh, a defeater. Because it would seem to me like if you're more skeptical, you would be heavily filtering all this stuff you're getting, but you'd be wanting to hear it. You'd be like, okay, show me more, show me more, because, uh, and let me just filter out all the garbage. And give me the most credible claims so that you can at least do some like detective work, you know, and and start finding. I mean, if you're looking for truth, it would seem like, well, the the scale is weighted in the side of experiences. Now, I don't know. That's just my digression at the moment. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And one of the things you mentioned there, too, is how uh, Christians might look at this stuff and they might going back to the new age and stuff and they, uh, oh, you know whatever uh this stuff's all hokey and and it doesn't have any basis in truth or reality but the one of the things i think that she demonstrates in the debate with todd wilson marcia that is is that this stuff has creeped in um and some mm-hmm. of us are completely unaware 
Uh, and so, yeah, I think that we need to be aware and be mindful of those outside influences that are creeping in without us even being aware of it. Well, let's go to the interview. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Welcome to the podcast, Marsha. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Ten years later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. We we, uh, we interviewed you before back in 2011. And I can't believe how fast the time goes. But uh, so we're going to re-ask you everything because we forgot. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right. (laughs) Well, we uh, in our intro, we talked a bit about your background in, uh, you know, being in the occult and uh, being a professional astrologer in the past for over eight years. And, you know, the different things that you've done in that regard. So we are very interested in your journey, but we'll be talking today about the Enneagram. And uh, but before we get into that, maybe our listeners would be interested, like, uh, boy, you know, what got you into astrology and, and maybe the occult area? To what extent did you get into that? And of course, they'll want to know, well, how would you get out of it? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what was your interest in, in upbringing that brought you into to the point where you're a professional astrologer and people are interviewing you and you're serving as a president of the Astrological Society and that sort of thing? Okay, well, it was a uh, really kind of a journey over a period of time, and I don't know why I had the interest that I did, but in high school, I had been taken to churches when I was younger by by my mother, who was, uh, as far as I know at the time, was sort of a nominal Christian, and my father was agnostic. And we moved around and lived in different countries, so I had a very patchwork background of churches, but I did settle in a Baptist church in high school, and I went very faithfully to the youth group and Sunday school and church, Um, and I considered myself a Christian, but I really didn't understand what that meant. I didn't know what the gospel was. I saw Christianity as a moral, a moralism that, you know, to be good. And that was really how I took it. And I got disillusioned with that. I had friends in other religions. And I started wanting to explore other belief systems. Um, I also had an interest in astrology and then the supernatural. I don't know where it came from, though, because uh, my parents definitely, you know, I don't think they ever even mentioned astrology or (laughs) zodiac sign. So I don't know what where that came from, but I did read the horoscope column in the newspaper, and maybe it came from that. I don't know. Um, so I had that very strong interest in that. Uh, and then I um, the supernatural, I'm not sure about that, but at the time there was a lot of talk about ESP, extrasensory sensory perception, And I think experiments had been going on at Duke University in that area. And my mother actually took a college-level course in it. She had sort of an interest in it. And those interests were all just kind of lying there. Um, And when I went to college, I got interested in Eastern religions through an independent project I did on Gandhi. And I was very taken with Gandhi and his ideas. Although, of course, what he was influenced by Tolstoy. I think it was Tolstoy who wrote The Kingdom of God is Within You. So that's a whole other story. I know I'm getting off the topic here. <laughs> but my interests were really, you know, they were kind of uh, narrow and broad at the same time. I, I kind of got into it through these different avenues. Um, and I also had some experiences, uh, one when I was 11, and then in college, these what I would call supernatural experiences that to me verified this supernatural world, this other world that I saw as spiritual. And I had a few, I knew a few people in college who were kind of into that. And so my interest just stayed on that area. And when I got out of uh, college, I explored it more in depth with a lot of reading, going to different like going to a psychic or going to an astrologer. And the interest just kind of grew over several years. Eventually, I decided to uh, get into it seriously. Um, By this time, I already believed in reincarnation and had really been influenced by some reading I did on, on Vedanta, which is a form of Hinduism, 
And Vedanta had a lot of followers in this country. And I had read some of the writings on that. Uh, And the supernatural was still there. So I started, um, actually, I took a class. And in that class, which was called Inner Light Consciousness, uh, we were taught to meditate, do um, healing, like remote healing with our minds, dream journaling. Uh, it was kind of like a little crash course in the New Age, but it wasn't called that. Mm. Um, that's really what it was. And and that meditation introduced us uh, to what the teacher called our spiritual master. and. Our spiritual master was introduced to us during a guided meditation. Um, And so we each saw who our spiritual master was. And, of course, this is a disembodied spirit, uh, Mm -hmm. which is commonly known as spirit guides, although he wasn't called that. And so I, um, I really, this was very, this figure was very real to me. And I felt his presence in my life from that moment on. And after that, I got into Tibetan Buddhism for a while uh, with a group that was meeting weekly. And then I went into Zen Buddhism. So there's stories surrounding all that that I'm going to skip over Mm because this is going too long. I don't know. After a few years of of just following those things, I decided to take classes so that I could learn something very specific. So I took psychic development and astrology. The astrology class, of course, <clears throat> introduced me to um, how to do astrology. But the first thing you have to learn in astrology is how to mathematically compute the chart. It's all math. It's just all math. Mm-hmm. Math being my, my worst subject and my least favorite <laughs> subject. <laughs> this was very challenging to me, let me tell you, because it's like the last thing I wanted to do was math. Um, and there are formulas you have to memorize in order to do it. But I did it because I was so motivated. And I got through that course, and then we started learning interpretation. And I was reading books, and I was taking psychic development, so developing my so-called psychic powers and having more experiences with that. And all of it was kind of converging there. And, Mm -hmm. And in Atlanta, where I was living at the time, there was a very active astrological society. And there was um, a man associated with that. Well, he was a professional astrologer. He kind of tutored me for the exam that I needed to take to qualify for a business license because Atlanta had a requirement that if you want to practice astrology legally in the city limits, you had to have a business license. But to have the business license, you had to show you passed an exam. And so uh, you could take the American Federation of Astrologers exam, which is a national exam given in various cities at various times. Or you could take the exam set up in Atlanta by the astrologers there, the Astrology Board of Examiners, which worked in conjunction with City Hall to get the exam. Exams given in City Hall. I took the exam. It's a seven-hour exam. And it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, You're given uh, a birth data and you're told to compute a chart on the birth data. You have to have all the formulas memorized. We couldn't even have a calculator. We had to to remember how to do it. And then they gave us another chart, which was the chart of a real person, although we were not told, of course, who this person was. And we had to write out an interpretation of the chart as though we were speaking to that person. Um, and that I spent, I took up all the whole seven hours, you know, every second. Of wow. I passed, I bought my business license. I pra- So I started practicing as a professional certified astrologer. And then, of course, I became very involved in the Astrological Society. <clears throat> I was on several committees. I eventually became president. I was also on the Astrology Board of Examiners and the group that formulated and graded the exam given at City Hall. And I was chairperson of that for three years. Uh, So I was, this was really my world. But I also was in touch with, you know, psychics and mediums, uh, tarot card readers, clairvoyance, you know, the whole 
the whole kind of a whole area of of occult slash new age, which in those areas overlaps a lot because the practices are occult practices, such as contacting the dead or doing astrology or doing tarot cards. But a lot of the people doing those things are new agers. So it's really a mixture there. And I'd say the mediums probably aren't as much new age as the others because they're probably more spiritualist, uh, which is a little different than new age. But, you know, it, it was pretty much a new age type world. And my friends were part of that world. So I just became a professional astrologer and saw that as my calling. I felt I had been an astrologer in previous lives. And um, I'm going to just, I'm not going to go into detailed testimony because of time, but I'm just going to summarize it and say that God intervened in my life and over a period of several months, kind of, I don't know, he was, he was like (laughs) breaking me down. Hmm. Uh, I was very resistant to the gospel. God just kind of broke me down and eventually... I got this impression that God wanted me to give astrology up, and I actually gave it up before I was a Christian, which is, a, a, to me, is a very strong evidence that, you know, this is, this is God, because what astrologer who's doing well in her profession and has a lot of clients and repeating clients wants to give that up? And, and plus, I loved astrology. So mm-hmm. it's the last thing I would want to give up, but but I did. Then I started reading uh, the Bible. God had drawn me into a church, and so I was in this church, and I started reading the Bible. And it was while I was reading the Bible that uh, God opened my eyes to Jesus and who Jesus really was, and that's when I turned my life over to, to Jesus. And I found out several months later that a young Christian man had been praying for me with a young adult fellowship at his church. And he knew me through a part-time job I had where I was actually working secretly as an astrologer for the employer. Um, He knew me there to give him information on the employees by giving me their birth date. But nobody there knew it. Nobody except him, not even his secretary. I knew him because he was a client and he was one of my astrology students. I taught astrology as well for several years. So um, it's interesting how God used somebody in my astrology world to get me into that job. And that's where that young Christian man was who started praying for me. And then (laughs) God would draw that to bring me out of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really an incredible story. And I think that the Lord gave me that kind of testimony because it shows, first of all, God did everything that, you know, what astrologer in her right mind, and certainly somebody, a non-Christian or an astrologer would think this, why would she give it up? And a lot a lot of my friends asked me that later, you know, what's what's wrong with you? Why are you giving astrology up? And it shows that God can reach anybody. Uh, I had been in the New Age like 20 years or more, and I was very, very devoted to what I believed in. Um, I had many clients. I, you know, was kind of known. I even got letters from people overseas asking me to do their chart. And I would, and that, and those days back in the the old dark ages, <laughs> we had cassette tapes. <laughs> <laughs> what are those? No, I'm just yeah, kidding. I, I know. <laughs> be some people out there who are like yeah. 20 year olds who are like what's a cassette tape and just so, google it people <laughs> google. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um you know so i would record it long distance i get their birth data i do look do the chart i'd look at it and i would interpret it on this cassette and mail them the cassette so that's how i did long distance clients and so i never saw these people at all i wasn't getting clues from them i didn't know them I didn't know anything about them. I would know their name and their age and their birthplace. That would be it. So (laughs) that, that all got, took me out of all of that. Eventually led me into a full-time ministry. I did it for a few years, part-time while I was working full-time and eventually full-time Christian answers for the new age. I went, I went full-time in 1998. This is 23 years ago. So this is, um, you know, 
a little bit longer than how many years I was in the New Age, probably, depending on when you start. So that's that's what happened, and I've been doing this full-time ministry. I'm still in full-time ministry. <laughs> it's a very interesting experience being in this ministry. Uh, it really is, and I've seen God do amazing things um, in it. So I'm really grateful for it. Well, so it seems to me like maybe there was it started with you for maybe like just some sort of fascination with it. Uh, would that be accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it seems to... It seems to be that's how a lot of people maybe are lured into yeah. occult stuff or yeah. witchcraft or, you know, I remember growing up and finding a Ouija board and uh, messing about with that. And it was scary, but fascinating. And then there was trippy things happening, you yeah. know, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there are certain experiences that uh, people have with the occult or things like that. And it's like, well, for me at that time it was undeniable that there was something happening there um, that was not simply just me tricking myself. Yeah. Now I'm sure maybe a question people would have, and I'm curious to know what, how you would respond to it is like, all right, now that you're out of that um, some people might think, Oh, well good. You're out of that. Now, now you're sensible and intellectual and you realize that's just all fake. <laughs> What would be your <laughs> view in that? Yeah. I, I'm imagining you're not saying, well, that's all fake, but yeah. uh, this is <laughs> more like false. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what's right. your response to that? I mean, how do you how do you view astrology, you know, new age practices? What's behind it? That sort of a thing. Yes. Um, yeah. Good. Good question there. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I do understand that the belief system is false. It's based on falsehood. But when you're in it, it seems very, very real. And you have these experiences that seem to verify it. That's one of the big things that holds people in. It's because you have an experience that, or usually experiences that verify it. That makes it very true and very real. Plus, if you feel that you're doing something good or something spiritual, it's beneficial to you. And so you have a desire to continue, you know, nothing, no reason to leave. In your debate with um, Todd Wilson on Unbelievable, I remember you saying that uh, your dad said, why, why are you doing this? And you yes. said, Dad, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I was helping people. Yeah, yeah. He asked me if I really believed what I was doing. My father, the agnostic skeptic, <laughs> and I, he was very appalled his daughter was doing astrology. And I said, I wouldn't do this if I didn't believe in it. If I didn't believe it was true and helping people, I wouldn't. I would never do something that I thought was fake just to do it. And you know, and I wasn't making a whole lot of money, so. You can't say I was, you know, doing it for the money because I wasn't making that much. But he really did wonder that. And I said, yeah, I, I only do it because I believe in it and because I see it working. You know, I mm. see it. I see it working. So that that's another thing. People see whatever it is working. And some of that may be because they're, you know, it's confirmation bias, of course, a lot of it. And there are other factors at work that make it seem to be working. But it's a very powerful thing, and it's very it's very persuasive. And so, when you're in that, we also feel a very a great sense of freedom. Um, and I felt very free because nobody was telling me what to believe or what I had to do. I mean, there are people that had suggestions, or they said this is what you should do, or this is what I did. But nobody was there saying, "Okay, really, that's wrong, Marcia. You need to do this." And so you have this freedom that you're kind of forging your own spiritual path. And yet you feel that it's, you know, that it's true and it's right. And, and you see things happening and you feel like you've progressed. So, you know, what's, what's basically what's not to like, you know. Now, I did have some bad experiences, um, but I was able to rationalize them. Um, I had questions that were not answered. You know, I wondered things and nobody had clear answers on them or they had different answers. But that wasn't enough to push me away from it. You know, I just continued until God intervened. So when it comes to something like psychic readings and things like that, some people would just chalk that up to 
cold reading or, oh. you know, that sort of a thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, but would your your view be that, well, there is some of that maybe involved, but there is actually, you know, familiar spirits or a demonic sort of uh, influence there? Because, yeah. you know, people will say, well, how could they possibly have known such and such? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's not something you get from body language or whatever. Right. What are your what is your take on? Yeah, that? there is. Yeah, there is a real spiritual dimension in these in these kind of activities and belief systems I was in. So there is a spiritual dimension to the New Age and to astrology and to tarot card reading, um, to psychics, etc. There's a spiritual dimension there. It's not just that they're doing something that's false. Um, and there are there is a whole contingent of people who do this as con artists. And that's a really distinct mm-hmm. group. There's really two distinct groups. There's the con artist group. And you read about them in the papers all the time. You know, some woman who's been taking, you know, $1,000 from people and telling them that she'll melt their gold jewelry and that will protect them from an evil spell or something. <laughs> and unfortunately, that mm-hmm. happens. It's, it's apparently not that uncommon. But that is sort of a separate group of people. I was not a part of that. I didn't know people in that. We were all very sp- spiritual and very serious about what we did but uh, there's a spiritual component to it and of course the spiritual master i had uh was my spirit guide was a fall what i call a fallen angel that tends to be the term i like to mm-hmm. use because when wow. you're talking to people in the new age and the occult i find fallen angel to be a better term than demon mm-hmm. demon has too much baggage with it and Actually, I think a lot of people think of a cartoon demon that you, you know, you see on cartoons yeah. or something, these yeah. little red creatures, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a fallen angel. And, of course, angels are very big in the New Age. I mean, they, they like angels. So they, they even have, you know, angel workshops or, you know, in their angel cards and you can contact your angel, etc. cetera. Uh, and, of course, this is a door, a door into contact with fallen angels naturally because you're not going to contact angels from God. You're going to contact the angels that are against God. And so when you open yourself up, when you're practicing these things, you open yourself up to contact with these fallen angels. And they are very active. Um, for example, um, all of all of my friends that I knew well who were astrologers or uh, psychics, all had spirit guides. And uh, they admitted this. This was not like a secret. Uh, this is a well, this is a well-known thing that you can have spirit guides. And you can even read books today, like uh, some of the well-known mediums like uh, Sylvia Brown and James Van Prague, who had TV shows or were on TV a lot. Sylvia Brown died several years ago, but in their books, they will write about their spirit guides and often have, and John Edward is another one, they'll have a section in their book about how you can contact your spirit guides. This is a common thing to find in these kind of books. So this is a, a part of all of that. And so these spirit guides, uh, I believe, because of what I experienced as an astrologer, will convey information to you about the client. So I would be looking at the chart and interpreting it according to my knowledge of astrology and just kind of gut feelings sometimes. And then I would get like a a picture or a word or some kind of realization in my head that about the person, about their life, uh, that would just all of a sudden be there. And I would share it with them and they would say, oh, wow, yeah, that's true. How did you know that? Which is what I, what I was doing. That was really like what you would call a psychic reading. Um, although mm-hmm. I was not a psychic and I was not trying to be a psychic or do psychic readings, <laughs> that would kind of pop up during the astrology session. And so I would I would just know these things. And sometimes I just knew things not doing astrology. I would just know something about a person when I met them, and it was it was just very real. And I would say it. I would say, are you or do you or something? And they would say, oh, yes. You know, um, I'll, give a, I'll give an example with astrology. I was doing a, a chart for somebody. I, I did know him. I didn't know him real well, but he was a friend of my, my former husband's. And um, at the end of the chart, I was giving him advice about what he should do with his upcoming 
influences, like I always look at the, where the planets are now and uh, the outer planets, how they're affecting the birth chart. And that's called the transits, and it's a part of the astrology reading. So you look at maybe um, where Saturn is in the chart, where is Neptune in the chart, is it about to conjunct a planet in your birth chart? That would have a, a meaning. So I'm looking at the transits and I'm telling him something along the lines of doing something new, breaking out of the box. Um, and I and all of a sudden I had a picture of him skydiving and I said, <laughs> I said, maybe you should take skydiving lessons. <laughs> and he looked he looked at me like this. He was very startled. And he said, wow, he said, I just signed up for that two days ago. OK, so <laughs> here you have an example. Now, wow. could that be coincidence? Yes, it could be. The thing is, is that I had a picture of it in my mind, though, which, you know, I wasn't like just throwing out a guess. So um, what I think it is, because this kind of thing happened frequently, I think that, um, you know, a fallen angel, uh, well, my spirit guide knew he had signed up for these lessons, conveyed that to me, and there it was. So that I had a lot of experiences like that, both doing the chart and not doing the chart. Mm -hmm. Wow. Chilling. Yeah, it is. I, I actually had another one. I want to tell this one because this one is really, is really intense. Is it okay if I share this one? Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't, I don't know. I've maybe shared this maybe on one program before. It, I, I can't remember. I've shared it in talks or personal conversations, but I was doing a chart for the um, head of a witchcraft group in Atlanta. I had come across somebody in the group and did her chart. And then the head of her coven talked to me and liked what I said and wanted me to do her chart. And then everybody in the coven wanted me to do their chart. So I ended up doing her chart. There were several of these neo-pagan witchcraft groups in Atlanta. And I eventually met many of them and, and did their astrological birth chart. So the way I met him is that this group was a very traditional group, probably from the Gardner, Gerald Gardner tradition, which Gerald Gardner started the modern Wicca movement in England in like the late early, sometime in the late 40s, I think. This group was led by a woman who they who was like the, you know, the lady of the group and then a man who was, they had to have a male-female balance. So in those kind of groups, when they do their rituals, they have male, female, male, female, male, female. So um, the man who was the head of the group uh, then had heard about me and wanted me to do his chart. I, I went to his house to do his chart. He was from England. Um, so, you know, who knows? Maybe he even knows Gerald Gardner. I don't know. <laughs> and he, um, I was sitting in his living room doing the reading for him. And he was very good at keeping a poker face. He didn't react much to what I was saying. And I was very nervous because he was kind of an important figure. And I, I felt like I don't want to mess up his chart. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm doing his chart and he's kind of like, you know, not reacting that much. And while I'm doing his chart, I had this picture. I'm describing something about him in his chart. This picture came into my mind of a figure standing on top of this rocky cliff looking over a body of water and wearing a cape that was like kind of blowing in the wind, I think. And it was very strong. I mean, it just really hit me. And it was, I was like, wow. I said, I just had this picture of you that I think illustrates what I'm telling you. And I described the picture. And then I saw this reaction on his face, like, like, like a look of surprise. But he didn't say anything. So I went on with the reading and I finished. And he said, I have a book for you in my library upstairs I'd like to give you and come up with me. And I said, OK. So we started up the steps and I was ahead of him. And as I went up the steps, he said, turn around and look at the wall. And I turned around and on the wall overhanging the steps was a big painting. And it was what I had seen when I was downstairs. The figure in the Cape, looking over the body of water. Now, needless to say, I'd never been in his house before, and I had never been up those steps. And I looked at it, and I said, oh, I said, that's what I saw when I was doing your chart. And he said, I know. 
And that was painted for him by some kind of psychic friend. And it was like a picture of his, I can't remember now, his higher self, his spiritual self, his true self or something. And so I have never forgotten that because actually at the time, uh, I mean, a chill went down my back because it was was so, it was so eerie. Um, Now, I do not think that was a, I think that's beyond coincidence myself. And it's, and I think that that was from my spirit guide. So there you go. There's a very dramatic example. (laughs) Besides the skydiving. Wow. I uh, wanted to ask you, you know, about that background and some and it's great to hear some of the things that you, you've talked about, because in my mind, it's I think it's important to differentiate between to confront that idea that says, well, if it's not Christian, then there's nothing in it. You know, right. if it, oh, it's just uh, a false teaching or a false source means, well, it's fake, yeah. like equating false with fake, right. you know. Right. So even though there could be fake psychics out there or whatever, yeah. or, fake there astrologers are. but they're, they're the, the point is is that they're tapping into something that is clearly not god's <laughs> this god being the source yeah let's transition to our talk about enneagram because this is something that's cropped up quite a bit i've yeah. i never read a book on, on it yet <laughs> or anything like mm-hmm. that but uh you know i'm involved in different facebook groups uh like dad's groups and things and people be like oh well uh enneagram what's what's your number and you know, well, your wife's this and you're that. Well, it would make sense that you're having a conflict right now. I'm like, what is this? So I keep hearing this like uh, happening in the culture where people are talking about this. So can you tell us a bit about, first off, maybe if people haven't heard about what Enneagram is, what it is. can you describe what that is for us? Yes, it is a nine pointed geometric figure. It has different figures in it, triangles and such. And each point has a number, one through nine. And each of those points represents what's called a type. And they they go by uh, similar names, although sometimes I see variation in the names, you know, like maybe the helper, the achiever, uh, the thinker, etc. So each has a name, the peacemaker. And the way it's used uh, mainly in the in the church now is as a personality assessment, a personality tool where you find your type that most describes you, and then you use that information to understand yourself better, to understand your strengths, your weaknesses, how to get along with others. Um, It's it's kind of, it's really, I, I, you know, I've heard it described as the Christian Zodiac, and I think that's a very, very good term, (laughs) because Hmm. that's really what it is, and it's as it's as uh, valid as the astrological zodiac, but it, it operates in a very similar way to astrology um, in terms of, of just how it works and how people um, believe that it's true. So uh, that's basically what it is. So a lot of people doing it think they're finding out their type and, oh, yeah, that, that's why I do that. That's because I'm a four. And then they feel that they have an explanation for their behavior, why they do what they do. But the here's the ironic thing is that that's not at all what the Enneagram is. The Enneagram, the types of the Enneagram are actually represent a false construct of who you are. And they represent what is called in the New Age and esoteric ideas, the ego which is a false self. It's a self that has been conditioned by your culture, by your um, upbringing, by your own belief system, by your experiences. You have constructed this ego that you think is you. And it is really hiding the real you, the true self, underneath all of it. So you are supposed to work through your type to find the real you. Now, um, that real you can be defined differently depending on which kind of teaching you're looking at, whether it's New Age or Richard Rohr, which is similar, but, but actually they're, they're different. They sound the same, but they're, di- they, they're based on different beliefs. And that's really the purpose of it, is to uncover the true self, which is always a, which is a self that either is divine 
is in God and has always been in God and never separated from God, according to Richard Rohr, or divine in the New Age. That's really the purpose of it. And the origin of the Enneagram goes back to those teachings and even goes back to a time before it was used with the types. It didn't even have the types on it when it first started in 1916. And one of the problems with the Enneagram, or many of the problems, um, are because there are so many falsehoods that are given about it. And all of the Enneagram books pretty much repeat the same thing, that it's ancient, it has ancient origins. Some of them will say, well, it probably goes back to Baker's Ponticus in the 4th century, or Ramon Lull in like the 12th century, it was a monk in Spain. It make it goes back to the Greeks, to Pythagoras. There's all kinds of <laughs> these myths. These come out of the New Age, because in the New Age, they love to think there are these ancient origins to things. The New Age worships ancient. And so things that are ancient, they see this wisdom back in the ancient world um, that's being that's come from way, way, you know, years, years ago, centuries ago, and now we have this wisdom. Uh, so a lot of these myths you will find, for example, there's reference um, to some of this in a lot of New Age websites. And these ideas are conveyed into the church um, through Richard Rohr's book, The Enneagram, A, a Christian Perspective, that came out around 1991. Interestingly, in the first version of that book, which had a different title and was published in German, they they wrote that there were no Christian origins to the Enneagram. And then in the later edition, they do they say it probably goes back to Vagris Ponticus. So this got into the church and big time. And I've heard so many pastors who support the Enneagram and Enneagram teachers say this. Uh, and it's completely untrue. There's not a shred of evidence for it. We know where the Enneagram began. It began in 1916 with uh, George Gurdjieff, who was this esoteric teacher, our Turkish Armenian. And he, or he was either Russian Armenian or Turkish Armenian, I always forget. And he went on this journey to seek out spiritual teachings from different teachers. Uh, he had a lot of tall tales about people he met and what he did. Many of them um, not only not verified, but later debunked. He supposedly uh, met up with some Sufis in this secret Sufi brotherhood. And they taught him the Enneagram and everything. Well, it came out later. This brotherhood never existed. There's the, it's, it's just made up. And a lot of these people who are these spiritual types who gather followers will will tell stories like this because it makes them impressive to their followers and it makes them seem like they have a lot of knowledge and wisdom. So this is a typical kind of thing that you find with these sort of people. So George Gurdjieff was one of those people. Um, I actually was influenced by um, a book called A Meeting with Remarkable Men that I think was written, supposedly he wrote his story, but it was written by somebody else and they made it into a movie that came out in the 80s. I went and saw it. I was very, very, very influenced by that movie. I was very, it had a spiritual effect on me. I, I didn't become a follower of Gurdjieff, but it had this spiritual effect on me. And so he had a lot of followers. And the way he used the Enneagram, he came up with the Enneagram was, it was a picture of, of reality. You could put all the laws of the universe inside the Enneagram. It explained everything. That was wow. his, that was what he said. It explains everything. And he would play around with the nine points mathematically. He put the musical scale around it. He said that it illustrated something called the law of three and the law of seven. And he just had all these esoteric teachings about it. And he was teaching his followers that we were all asleep and we have to wake up because we're all asleep to who we are and to reality. And we have to wake up. This is a typical esoteric New Age occult type teaching, of course. And you have to become the new man. And he had several steps you had to follow to become the new man. And the Enneagram um, eventually was used to illustrate some of these ideas. So that was how it was being used. And his follower, P.D. Uspensky, then carried on the teachings and wrote about them. He wrote four books about Gurdjieff's teachings. 
And so he's the one who wrote about the Enneagram and his followers were following the teachings of the Enneagram along these same lines. And that's how it was being used. And at the time, of course, the only people who knew about it were the followers of Gurdjieff and Uspensky. They both died in the late 1940s. And then um, for a while, the only people that had these teachings were their followers until Oscar Ichazo in the 1960s came across a group of followers of Gurdjieff. Now, this is the story. We don't know the actual facts. This is the story that seems to be the most common story. (laughs) And he got the Enneagram from these followers of Gurdjieff. Uh, And he took it and he started teaching it in his occult school in Arica, Chile. And he was teaching the Enneagram as had the nine points being like the ego fixation. And so these were the ego, the false construct of self. He believed we're all born with a pure essence, an unsullied, you know, pure essence that's covered up with all this conditioning and false beliefs and, you know, influence from the world. And it hides our spiritual self. And so you use the ego fixation to work through what what your fears are that have caused this false self so that you can realize you really have this true essence. So that was more or less how he taught it. And, (laughs) and he, um, you know, he had students and one of those students was Claudio Naranjo, who was a Chilean psychiatrist who came, who was gone a spiritual journey and came across Ichazo and ended up being his student. Now, although Naranjo was a psychiatrist, his specialty was the effect of hallucinogenic drugs on the mind. Hmm. And that was his focus. That was his big area that he studied. Um, And he himself took these drugs. And Oscar Ichazo took those drugs. uh, And they would have what they thought were spiritual trips and spiritual insights on the drugs. This is like you know, what was done in the 1960s in this country. Um, I guess it went into the 1970s. It's very common, LSD, you know, and mescaline. I mean, people were taking them to have these spiritual trips. Um, So that was his interest. Um, Achazo also had spirits that he claimed, he had names for them that he said he was in contact with. Uh, And he admitted this. Uh, He also said that his group was guided by an interior master. Now, an interior master is a spirit guide. Hmm. So you have, you know, you have this very hardcore occult teacher here doing hardcore occult things. This is very, very hardcore. (laughs) This is even more hardcore than I was. And so, of course, they're going to have spirit contact. This is just a given. Um, And naturally, Naranjo did too. And Naranjo took the Enneagram and went to Big Sur, California around 1970. And he went to a place called Esalen, which still exists. It's very new agey. At the time, Esalen was a very, very edgy happening place where you had (laughs) various people, like people into experimental psychology. Psychology was going through apparently a phase of of all these experimental things like gestalt therapy and other kinds of things that were very extreme. And people who were into it or teaching it were gathering there along with these edgy spiritual teachers. And it was sort of this this breeding ground for this uh, spiritual kind of new spiritual consciousness in the country, including the human potential movement. Esalen, I think, is considered ground zero of the human potential movement. So the human potential movement is not the new age, but they are connected and they're, they have some things in common. So that's where Naranjo was, and he was teaching the Enneagram there. And he was teaching the nine points as types. And these are types, and again, they're false constructs of the self. So he's teaching it there. And the teaching gets to a man named Bob Oakes, a Jesuit priest, and to a psychic named Helen Palmer. So then it has two pathways 
Uh, one pathway is t- through the Jesuits to the Catholic Church, and the other is into the New Age. Now, the in the Jesuit Catholic Church connection, you had Richard Rohr learning it. And he's a very important figure in this whole story, so I want to mention him. The Catholic Church never endorsed the Enneagram. And in fact, uh, in doing our book, Don Vino and jo- Joy Vino and I wrote a book called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret that came out in, 19, in 2020 exposing the Enneagram for what it really is and the real history of it. The cat, we, ha- we found documents, Catholic Church articles and stuff against the Enneagram and warning about it. So they never endorsed it, but it still got into the church and it was used at retreat centers and, and things like that. But in the New Age, Helen Palmer took it and uh, started teaching it and got students. And all of a sudden, it became a real big thing in the New Age because the kind of tool it is is perfect for the New Age because it doesn't have any basis in objective data. It's not based on psychology. It's not based on research. It's not based on studies. It's just this tool that you can kind of use the way you want. It's very flexible. And so New Agers really got into it, and they um, started using it for counseling people and as a spiritual tool, really, primarily. And I heard about the Enneagram when I was still in the New Age. Uh, So I heard of it. I kind of knew what it was. I wasn't interested because I was an astrologer, and for me, astrology was superior up to everything else. <laughs> like nothing can match astrology. <laughs> I right. mean, I had tarot cards. I studied numerology. I studied palm reading, um, you know, and I, I, I knew some about those things. And to me, they were so superficial compared to astrology, which is incredibly complex. So the Enneagram was kind of like, oh, it's got nine points and nine types. And like, oh, that's just so inferior to astrology. So I never got into it, <laughs> but it, it was there, and it really developed a lot in the New Age and got very big. In fact, most of the websites you go to now on the Enneagram are New Age websites, except hmm. now we have more Christian ones, unfortunately, in the last three years. But it used to be when I started warning about the Enneagram, I actually wrote my first article on it in 2011 on my website because I saw it in the progressive church. And it got in the progressive church via Richard Rohr's friendship with the progressives, who at the time were called the emergents. So the emergent church, Rob Bell, Brian McLaren, Tony Jones, Phyllis Trickle, other people like that. Richard Rohr, how they got together, I don't know. But they got together and are, are admirers of each other. And so Richard Rohr's Enneagram book apparently was of interest to these people. And they started presenting it at conferences. And that's when I saw it like, oh, it's in the, it's these progressive people are using it. Um, And so Christians might start hearing about it. I think I should write an article on it. So I wrote an article in 2011. Now, at this point, I want to say something really important. Claudio Naranjo admits in a video, a 2010 video on YouTube, that the information he got on the types the helper, the achiever, the peacemaker, the thinker, etc., came mainly via automatic writing, which is a form of spirit contact. And in the video, which anybody can go see on YouTube, he says that, you know, he got it from his higher authorities, which is what he calls the spirit guide. Um, I totally believe this since I had spirit guides, and this is what you would do. This is how you would do automatic writing. Um, You know, I know what that is. So he's claiming that, and he claims it also in another video I watched later, a really long video about his time at Esalen, which is very interesting, and his meeting with Oscar Ichazo. At the very end of that video, he talks about the automatic writing and how that's how he got the types. So what you have here is a tool that was formed and forged in occult teachings and developed in new in the new age, um, <laughs> with a lot of Jungian psychology thrown in, and then Richard Rohr's influence on it, with information from spirits. That's the enneagram. That's what it is. <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> it's the biggest deception in the church I have ever ever seen. 
Well, you know, and you know, what was fascinating is you did a little, uh, not a little, you did a debate with a pastor, a pastor, Todd Wilson on Unbelievable, uh, the Justin Brierley show. And what was fascinating to me about that, and I want you to speak to this, is that he granted uh, much of what you just said. Now, you gave a very condensed version, and some of the other yeah. things you talked about came up throughout yeah. the debate, but he did not press back against any mm-hmm. of that. He granted it, uh, which was very surprising to me. Uh, but then he tried to basically argue a couple ways. Uh, first of all, he said that this was uh, the genetic fallacy in, in a oh, sense yeah. that you, you were objecting to the Enneagram because of its origin. Um, and then also he 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 claimed that this is sort of like a wisdom tradition that you can easily yeah. Christianize. Uh, and uh, I would just like you to, to speak to that of, of the claim yeah. that, yeah, it's this it's genetic fallacy. And then also this idea that, well, OK, even if I grant what you're saying, if I grant these origins, which to me are very troubling. But if <laughs> if, if if, you know, for just for the sake of argument, I say, oh, I grant all that. But you we can still take it as a wisdom tradition and kind of slap a Christian sticker on it and and learn from it. You know, how how would you kind of unpack that a bit? Yes. Um, well, the genetic fallacy, of course, would be if you're saying something is a certain thing just based on its origin, you know, only on its origins and nothing else. So, you know, if, if, if pagan, pagans invented, you know, or used the wedding ring before Christians did, then the wedding ring is pagan and you shouldn't use it, you know, because it's got an origin. But sometimes the origins matter, sometimes they don't. Um, you know, that would be the genetic fallacy with the wedding ring or something like that, because a ring is neutral. It doesn't, you know, it's not good or bad in itself. It's just a ring. <laughs> it's a symbol. Yeah. But if you have a tool that you claim is going to give insights into who you are, it seems to me people would assume and want it to be based on psychology. They would want it based on psychological theory. Um, they would want to maybe based on studies and research that had been done, at least based on what Jordan Peterson calls the big five, which is an accepted category, apparently, by most psychologists, that there are these five categories of personalities and they're they're distinct. And most people fall into one of them. Uh, well, the Enneagram isn't based on that. It has nothing to do with the big five or any personality theory or any psychological study. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if I'm not mistaken in that debate, Pastor Wilson granted that up up to this time, there's there's no scientific evidence that supports this. Right. Yeah, he did. And and Richard Worth does the same thing. And so does Helen Palmer. They admit and Suzanne Stabile, who wrote um, the first big book in the church, The Road Back to You, with Ian Cron, admit it's not scientific. And an interesting thing to point out, I have so much I could say on this. <laughs> I'm trying to fit everything in. <laughs> sure. Suzanne DeBeal was mentored by Richard Rohr. And the next book that came out by Zondervan in 2017, The Sacred Enneagram, by Chris Horitz, H-E-U-E-R-T-Z, and I'm not sure how to say it. He was mentored by Richard Rohr. He and his wife are very close associates of Richard Rohr. And so you have Richard Rohr's descent. And Richard Rohr, I haven't been able to say much about him, but he has a heret- he has heretical views that depart from the essentials of the Christian faith. So, I mean, for example, he makes a distinction between Jesus and the universal Christ. So right there, you've got, you've got a heretical, you've got a false Jesus. But he has other, right. others. That's just one. So here he has two of his disciples. The first two books in the church are by two of his disciples. See, this is very, very troubling to me. Yeah. When I, when I discovered that, when The Road Back to You came out, I, I first didn't know who these people were, and I was just warning about it because it was about the Enneagram. And then as I looked into who they were and I discovered who Suzanne Stabile was, I was like appalled. <laughs> I was appalled because I had been following. I'd started tracking Richard Rohr. In 2013, and I had been doing post warning posts on him um, because I knew he was with the progressive. You know, I, I just thought people need to know about him, and, and it's good because now he's he's got more influence than he did then. 
I was troubled that the first two books were by disciples of his, and Ian Cron is a very close associate as well. He he is taught at Richard Rohr's school, um, and he endorses Richard Rohr. So, so you have that going on. So this, so you have this tool that has nothing to do with psychology, has no scientific uh, basis, and in fact, um, Jay Medenwalt, who is a ap- psychologist apologist who we quote in our book, did a psychometric test on the Enneagram and it fails. And the psychometric test is apparently this very technical tool. I read his article on it. I did not understand it. (laughs) I was like, man, this is above my head. It's a very technical tool to test a so-called personality test. And he used it on that and he explains why it fails the test. One thing he said is that the nine categories are not distinct enough to be categories. They overlap too much. That's one of the problems of of the Enneagram. So it can't be a personality assessment because the categories overlap. But then there's other things, too. And so it fails. And then he explains why people think that it works. And he gives all these psychological factors like confirmation bias, um, subjective validation, uh, the Forer effect, the Barnum effect, and et cetera. And he has he gives 11 different reasons in part two of his article on that. And those, and he says at the beginning, these are the same reasons something like astrology works. And certainly when people tell me, well, it worked for me, uh, the Enneagram really, you know, I felt described me and has helped me in my marriage. You know, I say, but I heard the same thing from my astrology clients. You know, doing wow. knowing my chart has really helped me, Marsha. It's really helped me understand who I am, or it's really helped me, you know, parent my child better, or it's helped me be a better wife or husband. Okay, all my clients thought my astrology readings helped them. They all thought the chart was accurate. They all thought that it was helpful. So does that make astrology valid? Well, I certainly hope one would say no because yeah. it doesn't make astrology valid because astrology is not valid. You know, of course, there's going to be little bits of truth there and people identify with that. And then they kind of, they want to see a pattern. They want to identify with a pattern and confirmation bias. All these factors come in that cause you to believe something is actually accurate when it's really, it's not really accurate. So a lot of tests have been done to show this. Um, I wanted to address the wisdom thing real quickly before I forget. Um, The wisdom tradition thing, yeah, that was really like when he said that, you know, and I think what I said in the program was, but the the Enneagram with the types is only 50 years old. So I don't see how it could be a wisdom tradition. I mean, it's 50 years old. The types as they're used today, we're going back to 1971. And that's 50 years ago. So. Uh, you don't have usually, as far as I know, you don't have a wisdom tradition after 50 years. Now, now somebody might say, well, maybe not the Enneagram itself, but all the wisdom behind it. Well, what what kind of wisdom is it? If you look at it, it's about the true self. It's this this pure, pure essence, you know, uh, or this divine self, or as Richard Rohr teaches it, we all have divine DNA. And our true self has always been with God and has never been separated from God. We're all in Christ because the first incarnation of Christ was creation. That's one of his basic teachings. So creation, he he did a podcast that, that I listened to not long ago and did a Facebook post on where he says the universe is the material body of Christ. What? Yeah. The universe is the material body of Christ. It's panentheism. Mm-hmm. Christ, Christ is contained in in the material world in the universe. This is not. I want to point out this is not a new age concept. The new age tends to make a distinction between the material and the spiritual. Even though they'll say there's a sacred energy in everything, it's not the same as Richard Rohr, who he teaches what he calls an embodied spirituality, and very and this is very much part of his embodied spirituality that. The material, the world is the material world of Christ, is the material body of Christ. So the body of Christ, and I think this goes back to uh, ancient panentheism where they taught that the world is the body, the body of God and, and similar kinds of teachings. So 
this is this is what Richard Rohr is teaching. And so he believes since we're all part of creation, we're all part of Christ, and the universal Christ is a is this power that is pulling everything on this evolutionary path towards a point of perfection. Now, this isn't just people. It includes animals. It includes the plants. It includes the river. It includes the rocks. It includes everything in creation. Everything is being pulled by the universal Christ, who is basically redeeming everything, although I'm not sure if he uses that word, redeeming everything through this power. Um, this is partly from uh, a man named Teilhard de Chardin, who I'm not super familiar with, but I read some about him because I know Richard Rohr was very influenced by him, and he, and he refers to him. Teilhard de Chardin was a Catholic, I believe he's a Catholic priest who was, a, I think, a paleontologist, and he was trying to reconcile um, evolution with Catholic Church teaching. And so one of the things he did is that he taught a cosmic Christ. And this cosmic Christ had something to do with evolution and and was pulling everything towards an omega, what he called an omega point. And so this teaching influenced Richard Rohr. Now, how I don't know if Richard Rohr's teaching is exactly the same as Tahir de Chardin. I don't think it is, but he was clearly influenced by him. And this so there's no second coming of Jesus. He doesn't he, he denies the second coming, uh, the literal second coming. Um, he 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 teaches that personal sin is not an issue for God. Corporate sin is what God is concerned with. So corporate sin is bad, and of course, corporate sin, as defined by Richard Rohr, has to do with social justice. Um, you know, big corporations and all the evil they do, the pollution, or or empires that are you know crushing the oppressed, etc. This is corporate sin. And that's what God is concerned with. So Jesus did not die for sin on the cross. Okay, he denies the atonement for sins. Um, he says that Jesus died because, he, first of all, he's showing love and suffering. Uh, love and suffering are the way we, trans, you know, we transcend to our, our spiritual self. That's how we grow to our spiritual self. And Jesus died as a victim of the Roman Empire. And Jesus died because Re, and this is a quote, reality has a cruciform pattern. So there you go. Reality I'm quoting, has I'm a quoting Richard Roy. pattern. <laughs> yes. Wow. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he likes to use that language like that because he's very influenced by Carl Jung. He sees things in terms of archetypes, which comes from Carl Jung. He has called Jesus an archetype. Jesus is an archetype. And for those who don't know, archetype, and I'm very familiar with this because guess what? Jung was a major influence on contemporary astrology. And guess what I learned when I was an astrologer? I learned a lot about Jung and his archetypes because they're wow. used in astrology. Mm -hmm. So I am super familiar with this part of Jung's teaching. I'm not an expert on Jung, but I am familiar with this. So when I read Richard Rohr, I catch all these Jungian references. And he and he he refers to Carl Jung. He he's not shy about it, but you can see it in what he says. And he talks about Christ as an archetype, and he's an archetype. And we seek that archetype because all archetypes, according to Jung, are in the universal collective consciousness. They're all there in our our unconscious mind, and we seek those. That's how we find meaning. So the hero, the mother. You know, the maiden, I, I'm not sure who all the archetypes are now, but, you know, Christ is one of the archetypes according to um, Roar. And so that's an archetype we aspire to. And by aspiring to this Christ figure, you know, if we really go all the way, which would be into Roar's teachings, then we can really fulfill this archetype in our life. Wow. But, you know, if you stop short and you think that Jesus died on the cross for sins, you've been... You're you're in this, you know, you bound yourself into this little tiny box where, you know, you aren't seeing the real truth. You, you've just seen a little tiny bit of it and you've been taught wrong. You know, the church has been wrong all these centuries, according to Richard Rohr. So as you see, even though he's uh -huh. a Franciscan friar and he's in the Roman Catholic Church, he, he's not teaching Roman Catholic theology mm -hmm. at all. 
He's, he's completely unorthodox. Yeah. So it, it, we've talked about the origin, um, the many problems lacking scientific data. Yeah. Uh, and uh, w- let's imagine that, uh, you know, the old elevator pitch question that comes up a lot. <laughs> let's imagine you're you know, kind of in an elevator with another believer and uh, they bring up the Enneagram oh <laughs> and th- they say, oh, you know, I know the origins are kind of sketchy, which I'd say that's a grand understatement. But <laughs> I'm just, you know, the origins are kind of sketchy, but it's it's just it's helped me so much and, and it's been so great. What would be one or two things in just that short elevator ride that you would want to point out to them other than, of course, say, hey, check out my website. I know that yeah. would, you know, <laughs> but what would be a couple things you would say to them to kind of to caution them, to, to get them thinking, to challenge their practice? Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, I've gotten comments like that on Facebook. And, you know, I, I try to give a short answer because I don't want, you know, I, I don't know how long I'm going to have them. They might just go away and <laughs> block me or something. So, right. uh, you know, you know, what I say is, um, but but saying that it helps you is not the criteria a Christian should use. For something that is supposed to be a tool about who you are, you really want to have data that supports it. So don't you want, you know, data supporting this tool? I mean, it's just saying it works for me. That's pragmatism. Is that the criteria for a Christian? And then I usually point out that's the, the same thing people say about astrology. You know, I, of course, I can say it as a former astrologer and, and yeah. it sounds pretty credible. But other people could say, but a lot of people believe in astrology and they think that they fit their zodiac sign or they fit their astrological birth chart. They think it describes them. So a lot of people believe a lot of false things and think that it works for them. Is that the criteria for a Christian? Because a false system can seem to work. And I think that's the problem. I think that's what happened with Todd Wilson. He got into the Enneagram. His sister-in-law was reading a book on the Enneagram by um, Riso and Hudson, who are both New Agers. Uh, Riso is is uh, dead. Hudson's still alive. Uh, Riso used to be a Jesuit priest, but be, apparently became a New Ager. And there was at least one other thing, a Jesuit priest that happened to. And um, they founded the Enneagram Institute. So I do want to let people know, don't go to the Enneagram Institute for your information. It's a New Age organization. Um, and it's And it was formed to support the teaching of the Enneagram. But she was reading a book by Riso and Hudson, and she apparently had read it so many times it was tattered. And so Todd Wilson was interested and was like, what are you reading? And she said, oh, it's this Enneagram. And then he got interested and started reading. And then, you know, he started doing, I guess he found his type. And then he really, then he said he and his wife started reading every Enneagram book they could get their hands on. Now, what books he was reading, I don't know. I'd be very interested to know what he was reading because some of them are, were probably New Age books. Um, and so he, I think because he thought it worked for him and he saw it working for him and maybe he started promoting it at the time he was a pastor in a church. He's he's not anymore, but he's the head of an organization he started for pastor theologian. Mm-hmm. Because he thinks every pastor should be a theologian. Mm-hmm. That's his idea. Well, he started promoting it to people, I assume, and got very enthused. And that kind of hooked him. That was kind of a hook, see? And then later, if you get the data about it, it goes against your experience and you don't want to accept it. Because you're going by your experience just like a New Ager. And this is one of the things I pointed out. It's so ironic. It's turning Christians into thinking like New Agers. Well, my experience is informing me that it works, and my experience is informing me that it must be true. Therefore, it's true. And I don't want to hear any criticism. I don't want to hear about its origins. Mm. I don't care if it's not scientific. It works for me. End of story. Goodbye. You have that kind of I've had that reaction from pastors. This is really sad. There are pastors who know the origin, and they know all this, and they still justify it. And they even have started organizations where they're training other pastors. Yeah. Okay. 
and and then there's people who plant who are big into um, Matt Brown of Sandals Church in uh, California did a nine part series on the Enneagram in nineteen in twenty nineteen. I did a post on it. He just came out with a book. Well, the book is coming out in October. It's called The Book of You. That's the name of the book. Wow. It's either a book about you or the book of you. <laughs> and there's a he has a promotion on his Sandals Church website, a video holding up the book. And someone sent it to me two days ago. I did a post that's on my Facebook page today. So if you're on Facebook, go to Christian Answers for the New Age. It's there. And, um, you know, this is going to come out from Thomas Nelson. Boy, you know, my estimation of Zondervan and Thomas Nelson has just fallen down a few clicks. <laughs> IVP has more books than any other publisher on the Enneagram. They have been spitting them out. And my co-author, Don Vino, was keeping, for a while we tried to keep track of these books and we were able to. And then once it got up to about 10 books, we started losing track. <laughs> and and so many started coming out in 2019 and, and, and 2020 last year. We couldn't keep up anymore, and the last count was like 35 books. And I don't know if, if Don is still keeping count. I've got to ask him. But here's yet another one, not self-published, but a major publisher. And so my, my point is, Christians, you don't want experience to be your basis for truth. Otherwise, you are thinking like a New Ager. You're thinking like I thought for mm. 20 years. This is how I decided what was true. If you go by your experience, you are going to be deceived. You need to have objective. You need to have something objective that supports your conclusion when it comes to something like this. And so that that's the point yeah. I usually try to make by saying, mm -hmm. are you just using your experience? You think it works for you. Is that enough as a Christian? Especially if the data is going to show you that it's invalid. Then are you going yes. to go by the facts or are you going to go by your experience? That's the question. That was a long answer. But, I mean, you can say that, like I said at the beginning, you can say it very short. Like, But if you say it, you're, it's true because it works for you, you're just being pragmatic and you're not basing it on anything objective. Well, it's like I always tell Chad, if there's a steady book deal in it, I'll believe anything you say. <laughs> Sadly. 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 And if the publishers are willing to keep putting this out and there are people who believe in the Enneagram, they're like, well, you know, I could write a book. Yeah. And I mean, that's what's happening. And now you have books. Um, Beth McCord, who uh, says she teaches the Enneagram, you know, from a gospel center viewpoint. Uh, Thomas Nelson published nine books by her, one on each type. Whoa. I think at the wow. end of 2019, nine books. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, yeah. and she, yeah, and she'd already, you know, published another book, I believe, and she has a whole business. I mean, her she's training other Christians in the Enneagram and how to how to coach people with it. So she calls herself an Enneagram coach, and this mm. is now becoming a more common term in the church. Enneagram coach. Uh, and we have pastors who have started. There's an organization called Gospel Enneagram, started by a pastor and some other people. They are training pastors in the Enneagram. Matt Brown, his church that he started, one of the things, one of his goals was to find dying churches and revive them. So he does training, or his people do training for all these churches all over the place. I assume that they're, he's going to give them his book and they're going to be training them in Enneagram because he's such an enthusiastic supporter of it. So you and then you have Ian Cron, uh, the Richard Rohr associate, going to the biggest church in Arizona and being uh, the pastor, letting him come on stage there and do a whole presentation that was videotaped, of course, it was during COVID uh, before the vaccine or before most people had the vaccine. And a very favorable presentation of the Enneagram, very friendly towards Ian Cron, who I believe is a perennialist like Richard Warren. I didn't explain that, but you can't be a perennialist and be a Christian. And having um, this man there and then giving three Bible verses that he tried to use to show that it gave the support to the Enneagram and it doesn't 
So I did a I did a whole post on how those three verses were misused. I just I was so appalled because I'm thinking if I can see that he's misusing these verses, why don't other people see it? You know, I'm not a great I'm not a great theologian. I'm not I'm not super super you know clever. I can see how he's misusing this, and a lot of people from that church make comments that they were very distressed by this. They were distressed by the fact that their 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 church had Ian Cron there present the Enneagram and how great it is and what a great tool it is. And after that happened, apparently they got some pushback and the main pastor made a video that was distributed to the small groups in the church, exp- uh, giving a defense of the Enneagram and saying mm-hmm. how you can explain this in your small group. And I was sent that video and I was told it was distributed. So it wasn't like a secret or anything. And so I did a post on that video refuting all of his points that def- supposedly defend the Enneagram. It's easy to refute. It's easy to refute hmm. their defense of the Enneagram because they don't have any solid ground to stand on. So they use things like Paul quoted pagan poet. That's a, a, Matt Brown uses that. Paul quoted a pagan poet in Titus 2 or Titus 1. And that's okay. So he says, okay, so see, we can use pagan things. Uh, it's like, no, that's, that's not, that's not a valid analogy at all. So, um, another guy named Bill Gaultier did the same thing, except he used Paul's, um, reference or quote of pagan poets in Acts 17 and on Mars Hill. And he uses that as his defense. So I did a post on that. So I have links to both of those in my post today on Matt Brown. The reason I'm talking about mm-hmm. these current things is because I want people to know this is still going on. And it seems to be growing. It doesn't have, I don't see any signs of it slowing down. Although I, I will say that the true, the facts about it are, are getting more widespread as people, you know, once our book came out, we were able to be on a lot of programs and interviews. People got very interested in hearing what we had to say in opposition to the Enneagram, because in most cases, all they had heard were things for it. And so I was on some programs. And that exposed it. And then more people heard about it. And then more people started saying, hey, wait a minute, this is bad and made their own videos. So the word is more widespread. There is more Mm -hmm. um, widespread information showing it's not true. So that's a good thing. But it doesn't seem to have slowed the the momentum down. (laughs) Well, you know, it was interesting speaking to that point. And I'm sorry I keep bringing this debate up. And I do want to... uh, recommend that to our listeners, uh, the uh, Todd Wilson uh, debate that Marsha did uh, and on Unbelievable with Justin Briley. Find it on YouTube. Uh, but um, one of the things that was fascinating is toward the end of the debate, he kind of he kind of conceded that the Enneagram was just probably a passing face. And I thought that was really odd because I guess from my perspective, I would think if it's based on what's true like why would you be so quick to grant that if it was such a if it was such a wonderful tool that was so eye-opening and so life transforming yeah why would why would it be why would you be so quick to grant that it would just kind of fade and it would just be a a, a fad um does that make sense like what i'm trying to say i just i found that surprising what you're saying makes sense especially if it's a wisdom tradition Right. I mean, are you going to say that? Well, this is a wisdom tradition, but it's probably a passing phase. <laughs> <Does it laughs> yeah, contradictory. You can't. You know, it doesn't make any sense. That uh, I my this is my speculation. It's only speculation. So, I wonder if he said that because in the back of his mind, he's thinking, well, you know, maybe once the facts really all come out on this, and people really start thinking it's not a good thing. I don't want to look like I'm really clinging to it or that I think it's going to last forever. I don't know. You know, yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that's kind of a guess on my part. I don't want to say he was thinking that, but that's kind of how I would interpret that statement. Yeah. I just found um, that very, jo- I found that very jarring. Yeah. Like yeah. when I was listening to it, like, yeah. wait a minute, what, what? I know. Yeah, it doesn't you know? go with what else he was saying. Like it why, just, if if it's just a wisdom tradition, like why go, or excuse me, if it's just a passing phase, then why go to bat for it so hard? You know, yeah. like why, why, I, I just thought that was an odd comment, but anyway, the, 
the the debate was very very good and uh um anybody listening that is knows people that are uh you know wrestling with uh the enneagram or thinking about it or using it and you kind of want to put a good tool in their hands obviously this podcast hopefully would be helpful <laughs> But yeah. also also that debate would be something to definitely use and just to send to somebody and say, hey, or here, you can hear, you know, two views of the same thing and make up your own mind. Because for me, I was not super familiar with the Enneagram. I was familiar with your work, like back when you did stuff on The Secret. I found that super helpful and, and distributed that. But, um, you know, I wasn't super familiar with it. I had heard about it. I knew people that used it. But after the debate, I thought, why, why would I want to use that? Like, what, what, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, that was my. So you did a great job. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, sure. Chad. Well, uh, Marcia, this is this has been like a fascinating conversation. Yes. And uh, I feel like we could talk about a lot of other things as well. Maybe in the future, we'll have you on for some other topics. Okay. But um, if sure. people are looking for more resources on the Enneagram or uh, other things that we've talked about today, whether it's uh, astrology or new age or psychics and things like that. Where can they find your resources and your work? Okay, thank you. Yes, my website, uh, ChristianAnswersForTheNewAge.org. If you go to the articles page, I have a lot of articles there on psychics, astrology, contacting the dead. I have articles on New Age books. I have articles on two of Richard Rohr's books, and I'm about to put a third one up uh, that I just read. Um, and on some, you know, new age authors or occult books like The Alchemist, uh, which is really very esoteric kind of. It's a novel. I, it's one of the most um, widely worldwide popular novels ever written. Uh, um, Co his last name is Colo, C-O-E-H-L-O. -E He's from Brazil. And uh, I used to hear about The Alchemist all the time. And people used to tell me to read it as popular in the new age. But it is it is one of the most widely distributed books in the world, believe it or not. So I have an article on that and all kinds of topics. Um, and, of course, I have six articles on the Enneagram there. Two of them were published. And then the other source would be my uh, Facebook ministry page, Christian Answers for the New Age. So just do a search for that. And I put posts up there on the New Age. and. Uh, new Age related topics. And then the third thing on a uh, source, which would be on the Enneagram, would be the book, Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret by Don and Joy Vino, my quote co authors, V E I N O T, uh, and me, Marsha Montenegro. And you can find that in a lot of places on Amazon, Christian Book, Barnes and Noble, Goodreads, et cetera. And it's on the publisher's website, Book Baby. Actually, there's a, a website, EnneagramSecret.com, and that's like a resource page for our book. You can go there and, and see the endorsements. We had endorsements from seminary professors, from heads of ministries. Dr. H. Wayne House wrote the foreword. You can read the endorsements, and you can read the first chapter of the book there. And Don Vino, who does that page, I want to give him credit because I don't do anything on it. He has put videos and podcasts there, too, um, on the Enneagram. So various programs. He probably put this one on there. I'll ask him to put this one on there when it's up. Okay. And, uh, you know, then people can go and even just listen to programs or watch them there. So that's a good page, EnneagramSecret.com. Well, Marcia, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you so much. And uh, hope to speak with you again okay. soon. Okay. Yes, that Thank would be you. wonderful. Thank you both. Thanks for having me on your program. I really enjoyed being on. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast. And we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetic stuff over at Truth Bomb Apologetics, 
That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Hey, do you love a good story? Great. Then you got to check out the Hashtag Storytime podcast. Each episode brings you the craziest, creepiest, and cringiest stories from YouTube, TikTok, Reddit, and beyond. My story is about the time that I was broken up with at the 9-11 memorial. Uh, twice. Look, the internet is a dumpster full of stories, and I, your host, Will McFadden, dive in headfirst, sift through the flaming trash, and bring you nothing but treasures. Listen to all 21 episodes of Hashtag Storytime now on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Picture yourself here. This mental getaway brought to you by visitpensacola.com.